Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! First of all today, Theresa May has reinforced her determination to press ahead with the process of Britain's exit from the European Union after last week's High Court defeat for the government. Judges ruled that Parliament had to be consulted before Mrs May triggers Article 50, which starts exit negotiations with the EU. Talking to journalists on the way to India, she warned MPs and peers who might seek to block or delay the process that a majority voted for Brexit in June and we should now deliver. The government has said that it will appeal last week's judgment in the Supreme Court with a decision expected in January. If the government loses that appeal, it could either introduce a simple resolution requiring MPs and possibly peers as well to back triggering of Article 50 or it could introduce a one-clause bill asking Parliament to authorise this. While MPs are unlikely to vote against a bill, they could try to amend it and therefore delay the Article 50 process. Yesterday morning, Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn suggested his party might vote down Article 50 unless Theresa May signed up to his Brexit bottom lines, including pressing for full access to the single market and safeguarding workers' rights. Later on, though, he appeared to change tack, saying Labour wouldn't block Article 50 but would fight for a Brexit that works for Britain. But it's members of the House of Lords who could be the real obstacle for the government. With the majority of peers Remainers, the likes of Baroness Wheatcroft, have said they should delay triggering Article 50 until it's clear what Brexit involves. Yesterday, Nigel Farage was asked about how newspapers had reported the High Court judgment and suggested there could be a swell of popular rage if Brexit isn't delivered. If the people in this country think that they're going to be cheated, they're going to be betrayed, then we will see political anger the likes of which none of us in our lifetimes have ever witnessed in this country. Those newspaper headlines are reflecting that. Well, that was Nigel Farage, and of course I have my two guests here to discuss all of this. Jacob Rees-Mogg, first of all, as well as talking about the risk of civil unrest, Nigel Farage said it was important that people who voted leave get even. Now he's talking about leading 100,000 people on a march to the Supreme Court. Do you think that sort of rhetoric and action risks inciting violence? I don't think Nigel Farage is inciting violence, really? no. Um, he phrases himself somewhat differently from the way I phrase myself, mm. but then we are uh, different types of politician. Um, I think that he is right to say that there will be extraordinary public anger and distress if a referendum vote is not carried through. That would be a real challenge uh, to our constitutional system if it doesn't work well enough to ensure the referendum result is implemented. But my expectation is that the result of the referendum will go through and therefore this will not arise. Right. Let's stick with the High Court judgment and some of the attacks that were made on the judiciary. Your Conservative colleague Dominic Greaves said the government was too slow to condemn the attacks on the judiciary. There was an expectation that the Justice Secretary Liz Truss would come out and condemn those attacks, not just criticism, but outright personal attacks on the judiciary. Do you agree with him? No, I don't. Um, Dominic is perhaps the cleverest man in the House of Commons and a brilliant lawyer, uh, but on this I think he's wrong. We have a free press, we have an outspoken press, and it is entitled to attack judges if it disagrees with them. Uh, ministers are not, and had ministers been rude about the judges, the Lord Chancellor would have been right to tell them not to. And members of Parliament in the House of Commons may not attack judges except on a specific motion. So there are controls on the legislature and the executive on how we relate to the judiciary. But a free press is a free press and it's been magnificent in pushing forward the interests of the British people. So I would stand up for the tabloids. Do you agree? Do you agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg? I mean, judges are criticised all the time for decisions they, they are, make. and it's right that we have a free press. But I would have liked to have seen ministers come out much more quickly to defend what I believe are true British values, tolerance, freedom of speech and respect for rule of the law and I wish that Liz Truss had done that. Uh, going forward, I think, that going back to the, the issues you raised at the beginning, I think that we need to calm down here on what's happened 
on the court ruling. I actually think there's now an opportunity for Theresa May to try and bring the country together. Uh, I, I, you know, Labour is not going to be voting against triggering Article 50. We do In any want, scenario. No, we won't be voting against triggering Article 50. We do want to debate and review and scrutinise the government's plans. And I don't think the Prime Minister has anything to fear from that. Right. Debate, review and, I apologise, I can't remember the final word, scrutinise, I think you said. Yes. So de debate, review and scrutinise. What would that mean, though? That would mean legitimately, if, the, if there is a, a bill going through Parliament, uh, legitimately laying down amendments? Well, I think the government may well get amendments from its own side, actually, on this issue. My preference, my advice to Theresa May, if she were to ask for it, not that I think she will, would be to put forward a green or a white paper setting out the government's broad aims and objectives on Brexit. I want to see clear debates on the floor of the House because I think that will provide some clarity for businesses and employers who are deeply concerned about some of the implications of Brexit. Uh, but as I say, you know, I think this is a, a real opportunity for Theresa May to bring the country together because there's going to have to be compromise on both sides, ah. give and take. Right. The well, leavers, with the leavers well, what... aren't going to get everything that they want and the Remainers won't get everything they want either, so we have to try and bring the country together. And what's wrong with that? Broadly having an outline and actually having some clarity uh, and, to some extent, calming down mm. the whole debate. I'm in almost entire agreement with what Liz has just said. Right. There is one bit where I think I would clarify uh, that Article 50 is separate from the debate on the negotiations. So Parliament will have a debate this afternoon on workers' rights once we leave the European Union. The European Scrutiny will, Committee will set out debates on any ministerial decisions that are important in the normal course of events. But Article 50 is the start of the process, not the end. And Article 50 is the consequence of the referendum result. That should come through, uh, ideally, through the exercise of the prerogative powers, but if necessary, a one-line act of Parliament to say this will happen. And in the normal scope rules in the House of Commons, uh, amendments would have to be very tight around actually using Article 50, not the negotiating strategy. Those two things are separate. Right. And do you agree with that, that actually we shouldn't have all of that detail and outline to keep businesses on board and sort of clarify to people well, what the plan before we actually trigger Article 50? Well, what, what I've said is... I think the best place to do that would be in a white paper and David Davis actually before he became the Brexit secretary said that was the best approach. Let's see what the government comes forward with. Um, but Scrutiny is really important. We had a debate in the House on Thursday about the impact of Brexit on financial service in, services and it was very interesting that the city minister said the trade minister was wrong to say we'd already given up on uh, passporting rights. We got some clarity in the House on that. That's why parliamentary scrutiny is so important and I'd like to see much more of that. In right, so you're calling for a white paper before Article 50 is triggered to see what the government is proposing. You are not. Um, what would you do if that is, in the end, what the government is to some extent forced to do, to actually show its negotiating hand, people might say, early on, before Article 50 is triggered? Well, the co courts can't force the government to show its negotiating position. All the courts can say is that there isn't legislative approval for doing this, and that requires an Act of Parliament. Uh, in introducing that Act of Parliament, MPs and later peers will face a choice. Do they accept the will of the people as expressed on the 23rd of June, or do they wish to frustrate it? And people who use delaying tactics, which is not what I think Liz is doing, oh. but there are some people who are using delaying tactics who, who want us to remain... Oh, well, Baroness Wheatcroft is oh. the example of In the Lords, quotes. yes. Um, and uh, Ken Clark has said quite clearly he's opposed to us ever leaving the European Union. But so that's not a surprise, is that's it? That's not a surprise, and it's fair enough. It's his long-standing And he voted position. against having a referendum and in the first that's place. That's right. So. His position's entirely consistent. But if people wish to go down that route, then they will be answerable in the court of public opinion as to whether this is a reasonable route to go down. Right. Well, let's just, though, come back to Labour's position, because it has been confused. I mean, you seem to be very clear about it now. But the day after the referendum, of course, Jeremy Corbyn said the government should trigger Article 50 immediately. Uh, yesterday, in the morning, he suggested Labour could block it unless red lines on things like workers' rights were accepted by the government by the evening. He said the party wouldn't. So, just to make it clear for our viewers, Liz Kendall, if there were amendments tabled, if there's a one-line bill that has to go first to the Commons and then to the Lords to say, do you trigger Article 50 or not, an amendment is laid down that says... Uh, 
Labour says we want to have membership or full access of the single market. If you don't get that, will you still vote for Article 50 to be Look, My understanding of the position is we are not going to vote against triggering Article 50. We do want to see a full and proper debate. Even if workers' rights aren't guaranteed? Well, or... Jeremy is absolutely right to say that as a Labour Party we want a fair and sane Brexit. We want to protect sure. workers' rights, have the fullest possible access to the single market and protect environmental standards. There's different ways of achieving this and putting pressure and influencing the government. But not with amendments that you would then vote against Article 50 if you didn't well, we get those amendments what, passed. We don't know whether the government is going to do an act of parliament, which David Davis seemed to suggest over the he weekend. Did. Now it seems to be a single, a single motion or a single line of a motion. We're not sure. We're if not sure if it is an act is. of parliament, though, because this is the key, uh, is that it could be delayed, uh, the process. If there were amendments laid down about the single market, about guaranteeing the rights of all EU nationals who are currently mm. here, and that was voted down, would you still be happy to vote for Article 50 to be triggered? Well, we're not going to vote against triggering Article right. 50. Right. Um, but, as I said, my advice to Theresa May to get out of all of this, you know, potential problems is to produce a white or a green paper setting out the broad aims and uh, objectives of Except the that's going to push, people will say that will push the March timetable well, out not, of kilter. It, I don't think it would. Well, it was the Supreme, Court, the Supreme Court judgment wouldn't come through till January. Well, my, my view is she shouldn't appeal the Supreme Court judgment. Sure. She could get on with doing that white paper. But she has. And, and the Supreme have... Court judgment will be in January. To get a white paper through, do you think the timetable could be kept for March if there was a white paper ahead of triggering Article 50? Uh, I don't think a white paper is necessary ahead of triggering Article 50. No, I know you don't 50. think it's necessary, so but do you I, think it would push the timetable? I, th I don't think this is going to happen. Right. The, the, the white paper is, um, at this stage, an irrelevance. The question is, how do you trigger, art trigger Article 50? And I would be surprised if a simple resolution was sufficient because mm. that could go back to the courts. The courts can't consider proceedings in Parliament, and a resolution is not mm. law. You well, see, Jacob's right on this point. Yes, it was the, uh, in the case that actually won in the end, uh, an act of Parliament was central to it. The actual judgment didn't say there should be an act of Parliament. They left that open, but it may well be that that's true. Yes, but you don't want to have further court... Uh, but, but, no, we don't, but, but it, it's not yet clear what the, the law, law lords would actually recommend. The courts can't demand any particular proceeding mm -hmm. in Parliament, so they can say that there ought to be a law allowing for it, yeah, but they can't say any particular parliamentary procedure can take place. What if the government, Jacob Rees-Mogg, to look at it from your perspective, ha said they thought it was necessary to remain in the single market and under the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, and let's say amendments on those were passed, would you then still trigger Article 50? Article 50 means we leave the European Union. Remaining in the single market with the jurisdiction of the ECJ means we remain in the European Union. These two are completely contradictory. So you would vote against Article 50 in that motion? No, no, in that I motion. would vote in favour of Article 50, which is about leaving the European Union. But leaving the European Union means you're out of the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. And do you Otherwise accept that? You've in. Well, you see, this is the... Brexit meant different things to different people. Some people voted purely on the issue of parliamentary sovereignty. Many, because they wanted to reduce immigration. There are different options here. There ah. are, there's a Norway option, a Switzerland option, a Canada option, or being completely out like Singapore, uh, the sort of more hard Brexit end. Sure. The, tr the government says they want to have a kind of hybrid version of all of these. The truth is, if we want to get the right balance, being able to right. deal with freedom of movement, have access to the single market and protect workers' rights, there's going to have to be compromise on all sides. Mrs which May have to do. has said very clearly that we will be out of the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, which means we make our own law mm. in the United Kingdom, in our own Parliament, and no longer are subservient to Brussels. That's absolutely key. Without that, we haven't left the European Union. Let's leave it there for the moment. Now, it's time for our daily quiz, and Prince Andrew has got into trouble for voicing an opinion. Heaven forbid, we all know the royals aren't allowed any of those. So our question for today is, what was he complaining about? Was it A, the ban on hunting, B, Jeremy Corbyn's leadership, C, a house-building scheme that might affect a golf course, or D, Brexit? At the end of the show, Liz and Jacob will give us an answer. We don't know, right? We don't know, we don't know. You can have a guess. So, if you're one of India's high-flying super-rich, it could be about to get easier for you to come to the UK. But Theresa May, who's on a trip to India to promote trade and British business, isn't going to make it any easier for Indians wanting to come and study, or those with specific skills, such as curry chefs, to come to Britain. Here's what she had to say in Delhi this morning. The UK and India are two countries with an ambitious, confident global outlook. 
As the UK leaves the EU and India continues its rise in the world, we should seize the opportunities ahead. We will achieve this through the strong bonds that exist between our people, through British and Indian businesses working together. But most of all, we will accomplish this because Prime Minister Modi and I are personally committed to investing in this relationship and turning this vision into a reality. The Prime Minister there. Well, let's speak to our correspondent in Delhi, Justin Rowlett. Thank you for joining us today. Um, listening to Theresa May there, before we sort of get into the deal that they may or may not do, what are the sort of trade levels done between the UK and India? Trade levels aren't massively high. In fact, trade levels have been falling. I think India, uh, Britain is now the 18th biggest trading partner with India. So it's not a brilliant trading relationship. What Britain and India are very strong on is investment. So Indian companies invest a huge amount in Britain. Um, they own Jaguar Land Rover famously, Tetley T, Typhoon T, all sorts of other businesses. Jaguar Land Rover alone is the largest industrial employer in Britain. So the investment's very high. There's actually a lot of investment from British businesses in India. Standard Chartered Bank is huge here. Uh, JCB, Costa Coffee, those kind of businesses are doing very well here. So there's a lot of investment, but actually levels of trade have actually fallen back over the last few years. And that's one of the things that both uh, Prime Ministers want to focus on. Right. So is the visit largely symbolic? Because David Cameron uh, made a, an early visit to India too. And as you say, trade levels don't seem to have increased. In fact, they've fallen back to some extent. And I mean, is Narendra Modi really going to give any concessions if he doesn't feel Britain is going to give him more visas? I think, I think that, you know, there will be specific deals. There always are in these meetings. They'll have a whole kind of uh, back pockets will be full of deals that they'll announce at the end, which will probably be meaningful in terms of total amounts of trade, you know, a billion dollars here or there, a, a couple of thousand jobs, perhaps. What the real agenda here for Theresa May is a longer term one. It's about point, look, creating a world of opportunity for post-Brexit Britain. It's about trying to secure some kind of trade deal with India, which would allow Britain access to this fast-growing and huge market. Now, on that, I think uh, it's going to be very hard work for Britain to get, uh, to get anything out of uh, Mr Modi. The European Union was negotiating for nine years with India, trying to get a, a free trade agreement. Um, there were all sorts of sticking points in that, that deal, which meant that after 18, 16 rounds of negotiations, um, there was no deal done. And I don't see why uh, India would want to make any concessions to Britain to get access to Britain's market that it wouldn't do to Europe. So I think there's a, a big struggle ahead for a, for a wider trade deal, although we'll get the usual round of kind of smaller scale announcements between the two leaders at the end of this, uh, this three-day uh, visit. Justin Rowlett, thank you very much. And we are joined now from Delhi by the crossbench peer and founder of Cobra Beer, Lord Billamoria, who is part of the delegation with the Prime Minister in India. Lord Billamoria, we heard Theresa May say that the UK's relationship with India will flourish because of her and Narendra Modi's personal commitment. Do you agree with that? There's no question we have a very strong base uh, for the UK and India. It's a very close relationship. In fact, I would always say that along with the United States of America, India is a country we have the closest relationship. There's a, there's a bedrock of trust uh, and there's no problem with that. The only problem mm. is the EU referendum. Uh, that is the uncertainty. Every business leader I've spoken to here, everyone in government, everyone in the civil service in India, uh, they all say we shouldn't be leaving the EU. And, and they're all worried about the uncertainty ahead, uh, which will last for years. What uncertainty are they worried about regarding which part of the economy? Well, for a start, Indians look upon the UK as their launch pad into the EU. We've just heard Indians have invested in a big way in the UK and have created over 100,000 jobs. But more than that, Indian companies see the, e the UK as, as their headquarters for the EU. And you've already heard Indian companies say, IT companies, for example, well, if the UK is going to leave the EU, we're going to have to have the UK office and another office in the EU for the EU. That's extra overheads. That's extra cost. We don't know what's going to happen. And there is still no certainty as to, A, whether we leave the EU and, B, how we leave the EU. Um, and, and the hard Brexit is, I suppose, what scares uh, people in India the most. And also where this visit is concerned, I think the Prime Minister is missing a huge opportunity because we talk about trade deals, but trade deals are not just about tariffs. They're also linked 
to movement of people, oh. to business visitors, tourist visitors. And at the moment, where India is concerned, we've seen here, the Indians have seen the Chinese with President Xi coming over to the UK last year and the UK announcing a two-year multiple entry visa for less than £100 for visitors from China. Prime Minister Modi came within a month after that. No such uh, uh, concession for India. And now here we are. This was an ideal opportunity for the Prime Minister to stay here in India. You can have exactly the same as we're offering China because then we know there are many Indian visitors we lose out from in the UK and the UK economy loses out on because they go as far as Paris and do not come to the UK. Right, Lord There's another opportunity that's missed over here. Yes, just, just stay with us. What do you say to that, For, Jacob Rees-Mogg? Oh, ha hang on a second, Lord Billamore. I'm just going to put some of your points to Jacob Rees-Mogg. Uh, I mean, Indians are scared by the uh, consequences of Brexit. And in terms of trade deals, why would Narendra Modi give any further access to goods uh, in India if we're not going to give further freedom of movement to people? from India? Well, there's a difference between freedom of movement, which is people coming to work permanently or move permanently, and tourist and business visas. And on that, I'm entirely with Lord Billamoria that we should give at least as good terms to India as we give to China. It's quite wrong that we should give preferential terms uh, to China rather than one of our closest allies. So, so, so why is Theresa May not doing um, it? Well, these things develop and evolve, and it'll be part of a trade negotiation, no doubt, at some point. Um, why should India want to give us more than the EU. It won't be that. It will be that we have the capacity to do a deal because we don't need 27 other partners to agree. The EU is unbelievably slothful in doing trade deals and we've had uh, the issue with um, CETA being held up by the Walloons uh, and the um, TTIP being held up by Parmesan cheese, that the EU is incapable of doing these things, right. and Britain can. Well, let's put that to Lord Billamoria. Do you think it would actually be easier? Do you take Jacob Rees-Mogg's point that actually, on its own, the UK will find a smoother path to doing a trade deal with India? Well, the, 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 that should be the case. You've seen with Canada, one country doing a deal with the EU took them eight years, oh. and even then it almost, uh, as Jacob said, stalled at the last minute. But it's, remember, these trade deals are not just the UK. It's India also being concerned about various issues that apply to the UK as much as they apply to the EU. But just to go further, the other opportunity the Prime Minister is hugely missing over here is with regard to international students. Uh, Indian students, five years ago, the number of Indian students has halved since five years ago because the messages that are being sent out is that we're a negative towards international students. And I'm the president of the UK Council for International Student Affairs, 450,000 foreign students in the UK that bring in £14 billion to our economy, enrich our economy. And then there's this misnomer and myth that they stay on. There's a, there's a report, I believe, buried in the Home Office that is not being released that shows that the actual figure of international students staying on is one to one and a half percent. The vast, vast majority go back to the countries and become ambassadors, generation-long ambassadors for our country. Right. And so let's we put... should be taking international students out of the net migration yeah. figures. Right. Should they we should come be out? setting targets Definitely. to increase Definitely. the number of international students. Right. Well, let's put that to Jacob rees well, If you uh, took those, if you took those students out of those figures, you may get a bit closer to the tens of thousands uh, net migration figure. But also, you are missing out on income to the economy that's just been outlined by Lord Miller. I actually think there are two separate points. Uh, one is the um, apparent unwillingness to take students altogether, which I think is a mistake. I agree that they are an enormously valuable relationship builder with other countries. Mm. And if you think of somebody like Lee Kuan Yew, who studied at Cambridge and gave us an interesting relationship with Singapore for the whole of his lifetime, this is very important. But on the net figures, um, if only 1.5% stay, then in the net figures it makes no difference. And we don't want to confuse the gross and the net. It, it makes no odds taking them out of the net figures because they are, in fact, leaving. Right. And just answer the other point, though, about the money that is lost in terms of discouraging, or they are discouraged uh, as a result of the messages that come out of the UK. Look, I think that is a mistake. I think we should be very welcoming to international students, and they make no difference to the net figure because they do well, go home. Take that. Ju sorry, just before I come back to you, Lord Billamore, do you accept that, that if they are only 1.5% one, one staying on, then there is no point taking them out of that net figure? Well, I think they should be out because that gives a clear message to people. Look, what, whatever you may think or want people to have heard, Jacob, People across the world think that, you know, we don't want international students here, uh, that we are not open for business, we don't welcome people from across the globe. And I would say we're, we often talk about trade in goods 
One of the big issues that we want is to increase access for our financial services in India, particularly things like insurance companies. Now, we don't need a huge trade deal to do that. It isn't Europe that's blocking that. It's the difficulties within India and this country that India has been so far reluctant to open up its financial mm. services market for our companies, and we have been reluctant to move on things like visas. We could sort that out. It's nothing to do with Europe. Where Europe really does matter is companies now thinking, why, you know, invest in the UK? The UK was our route into the rest of Europe. We're not sure any longer. The very least Theresa May could do is say, we will have transitional arrangements between triggering Article 50 and Brexiting to give companies greater certainty in the short term. All right, well, I mean, Lord Billamore would agree with you, no doubt, on, on pretty well all those points. But um, you said, uh, Lord Billamore, that you don't feel that there is a welcome here for Indian students. Is that the perception in India um, amongst the student population and others that Britain is no longer welcoming them here? There's very much a perception mm -hmm. uh, that it's difficult to get a visa to come to the UK, that we're not welcome. After all, let's not forget that Theresa May, when she was Home Secretary, said that she wanted international students to leave the day they graduated. And you well, know, other countries are competitor <laughs> countries. We're, we, well, leave the day they graduate. You, you, that's not a welcoming message at all. The, mm. the headlines here in India were take our money and get out. Yes. And also our competitor countries are actually laughing at us. Australia is saying we welcome international students. Canada is saying we welcome international students. And America and even the European non-English speaking countries, Indian students are looking to Sweden, Germany and Holland. We are losing out over here and we're losing out to lifelong ambassadors, generation long links and most importantly our domestic students get enriched by international students. And let's not forget the one issue nobody's talked about. What about the one and a half million diaspora, the Indian diaspora in the UK, the most successful ethnic minority community in the UK, oh, yeah, people like Savanki Ramakrishnan, Nobel Prize mm -hmm. laureate from Trinity College Cambridge and the first president of the Royal Society from an ethnic minority. I mean, this is what the, the contribution that's being made by the Indian community in the UK, which we should all be celebrating. Right. I mean, Jacob rees taking that on board, doesn't the idea of Brexit that you have explained on this programme about it giving opportunities for more free trade, I mean, it is a lie in so far as you can't drastically cut levels of migration and still flourish as a global trading nation if countries like India are not prepared to open up to their goods well, we can take tariffs off Indian goods unilaterally. There are very high tariffs under the EU common external tariff, which we could simply remove, which I'd be all in favour of doing. If you would and give them free movement of their people well, uh, to come here? In terms, we're not going to give free movement of people More to other movement. countries. This is a question of visas for business and tourist mm. travel. Uh, which of course we can give more of uh, when we're not going to be having 300,000 people coming every year from the European Union. That it's a question of priorities and in my view it should be just as easy to come here from India as it is from Italy. We shouldn't discriminate against India. That doesn't mean we should get rid of all our controls. It means there should be a level playing field for all the countries in the world. So things are going to change Lord Billamore just finally. You have a net, you have a net target you have a net target of 100,000 to reach 100,000. How can you reach 100,000 if the non-EU immigration alone is 180,000 and you can't get rid of all the EU immigration? We've got 5% unemployment, the highest level of employment. We've got over 3 million people working in the EU. How would we be the fifth largest economy in the world without the contribution of all these people. All right, Jacob, well, well, this is the, the, uh, the, the whole approach to immigration is not sensible and logical at all. Hold on, the, Hang on. Yeah, go on. The immigration that we have had has reduced our GDP per capita, even if it's led to an increase in our GDP. Sure, but what about the point of hitting um, that target and the, still doing what you said? The, if they're, they're students, which we're talking about to start with, and they're leaving, they have no effect on the net migration sure, target. But we know the non EU we, target is still 182, yeah, the but current figure is 182,000. If we that the visas are available for the most highly skilled people, we can make sure they're coming in where they will be most valuable. Uh, to the economy. It's a matter of controlling it and directing it in the areas that are most economically beneficial, not just accepting a free-for-all. Lord Billamoria, thank you very much. There is... Th th thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Theresa May is in India on her first foreign trip outside the European Union since becoming Prime Minister. She's focusing on trade, but she's come under pressure from the Indian Prime Minister, Narendra Modi, to relax travel restrictions for Indians wanting to come here. That's a view supported by the British businessman James Dyson, who travelled with Mrs May. She's been speaking to our business editor, Simon Jack. The UK is in the market for new friends or reviving old relationships. 
India is the fastest growing economy in the world, and yet trade with the UK is falling. Room for growth, said the two leaders today. When you talk trade, immigration's not far behind, and one prominent Brexiteer thinks the UK needs to rethink its hardline approach to attract more Indian talent. We should allow foreign engineers and foreign scientists into England on full-time visas. And students who study engineering and researchers who study science and engineering at British universities should be able to stay in Britain. Um, Theresa May did have good news for business travellers but wasn't budging on students. Well, we have been, we have a, a good offer for students and of course we do see a good number of Indian students coming to the UK. A declining we number though, a, 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 we, a we big decline in numbers. We recognise that there is an important issue in terms of business for making sure that for business travellers um, that is a smooth, coming to the UK is a smooth process for Indian business people who want to come here. One of the great attractions of doing business in the UK that people talk about is, is the rule of law and yet we've seen in the last week um, a court going about its business applying law being pilloried. I value the independence of our judiciary of course when they consider any case before them they look at the legal arguments. I also value the freedom of our press. Now let's just look at the Article 50 judgment. Of course there have been two cases on Article, the triggering of Article 50 and the role that Parliament should play. Two cases in the UK, one in the Northern Ireland courts which found in favour of the government, one in the High Court which found against the government. We're appealing the High Court decision, so the decision, the judgment, final judgment, will now be taken by the Supreme Court. Uh, if it were the case that the Supreme Court was to uphold the view of the High Court, uh, then of course the judgment would set out what uh, the, the, the details were. At the moment they haven't specified in terms of the High Court decision uh, and as I say we've got strong legal arguments we'll be putting before the Supreme Court. Of course Parliament will be having a say on these matters. But I've what made about that, what exactly? Uh, well, uh, Parliament will be having a say and this week they're having their first general debate on issues relating to the membership of the European Union and coming out of the EU. But crucially, I don't think anybody should forget uh, why we're doing this. We're doing it because on the 23rd of June, we had a referendum. But the, what the British people answered was a very simple question. Do you want to be in or out of the European Union? What we've learned since then is this is a complex business. What you need, some say, Prime Minister, is this is the proper business for a manifesto. You can lay out exactly how you want to do the process. You need a general election. I've been clear that I think the next general election should be in 2020 and the government's getting on with the job in delivering what people voted for on the 23rd of June. Are you ruling out a general election before, any time before 2020? I've, I've been clear on this right from but, when, before I became that's Prime what Minister. Like to do, no, well, I, I've been very clear right from before I became Prime Minister that the next general election should be in 2020. Should be. We should get on, we should get on with the job. The job of finding new markets started today. Simon Jack, BBC News, Delhi. Well, now, let's take a look at some of the night's other news. Brexit Secretary David Davis has said that the timetable for leaving the European Union has not changed, even after last week's High Court ruling that MPs must have a vote on triggering Article 50. The government is thought to have begun drafting legislation in case it loses its appeal against the judgment. Today, on a trade mission to New Delhi, Theresa May said the UK will only ease visa restrictions for people coming from India if the process to return illegal immigrants and overstayers is made faster. Our political editor Gary Gibbon has this. Delhi is gripped by crisis levels of smog. Theresa May has come here to boost stagnating trade between Britain and India. But in an echo of the arguments she'll face in Brexit negotiations, India's Prime Minister says access to markets here will only come in return for easier access to Britain for Indian students and business people. The UK will consider further improvements to our visa offer if at the same time we can step up the speed and volume of returns of Indians with no right to remain in the UK. And the UK will continue to welcome the brightest and best of Indian students, with the latest figures showing that nine out of ten applications are granted. But Indian student numbers are down sharply, and the Prime Minister is still set on squeezing overall net migration to the UK. The scope for trade-offs is hard to pick out. In the Commons, uh, MPs discussed speaker. last week's High Court judgment that Parliament like must pass a bill House before Brexit starts. Some MPs accused the newspapers and some Tory and UKIP figures of outrageous reference. attacks on the well. judiciary. If we see a situation where our judges are intimidated, harassed and we have marches on our courts, 
That is taking this country down a very dangerous avenue indeed. It is important for our reputation, after we have left the European Union, that all of us speak up for the independence of the judiciary and, above all, do not regard freedom of expression in the press as any excuse for personal, abusive and, frankly, disgraceful uh, innuendo being raised against individual members of her judges' dis- judiciary. That undermines us all. One of the great things about our Supreme Court, indeed all our courts, is it wouldn't matter how many people marched, it wouldn't move their judgments by one comma. And that's what we should be proud of. David Davis said if the Supreme Court backs the High Court decision, he believed a full parliamentary bill would be necessary. And he echoed the words of Theresa May today visiting the shrine to Mahatma Gandhi. She's accused those who wanted to amend any such bill with their own ideas of what Brexit should look like of being wreckers simply trying to stall the whole process.